Hi guys, it's Blackie. And Bear. And here is always what, 27? 28, I think. 28, 27, yeah. some number beyond one. <laughs> we hadn't done one in a while, and decided we were going to get together and do a little bit of talking about various things. And uh, Bear wants to make him a spoon, so we went and cut a piece of mimosa. And I was sitting here looking at, let me show you the mimosa bark. This is a hunk of mimosa bark. This is extremely pliable bark. Now when you take it off the tree, think of it like wet birch bark. As long as it stays wet and it's got a, like a slimy layer, you can flex it. As soon as it dries out, you can't. So you can form it into baskets, you can form it into whatever right quick, sew it like leather, and then it'll harden and form a basket real quick. So this is like the southern birch bark. It's the mimosa tree. Actually, it's called silk tree. If you look it up, but here in the south, we call them mimosa. Okay? And here's what it looks like on an actual hunk that we cut a while ago. You gotta understand that you can cut this, you can crop this thing and winnow, willow it. You cut it and it'll grow right back. So it's hard to kill these trees. Yeah, you have to dig the root up to kill it. If you cut it off the ground, burn it, you think it's gone five years later, the thing will sprout. Yes, it will. Oh. I, I can't stand the most of just to be honest with you, but my grandmother loved them. That's why my yard is full of them. Well, they actually, in Asia, for Asian medicine, they're called the wellness tree because the tea, apparently the whole tree is edible, as I understand it, including the bark, but they would make a tea from it and when drinking it, it has a sedative effect. It does not make you high or anything. It just makes you feel very calm. And so it's still used in parts of Asia as a medicinal to treat anxiety and things like that. So I have not, I have made tea out of it. It didn't taste bad, but uh, I Did have- Did you make it out of the leaves or the bark or the root or what? I made it out of the leaves. I just dried leaves and did it like I'm making regular old drinking tea. And as I understand it, the whole, as I understand it, I have not verified, so don't quote me. But as I understand it, the whole tree's edible, including the bark. So that, you know, and it's a source down here for us in winter foraging because we can always find these things. Yeah. And, uh, That's something I'll have to go to my books and look up. Speaking of books, I brought a couple to share with you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. I am using it. A couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> I was watching this guy on YouTube that I subscribed to. Oh. Go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> I forget I'm shooting this with him now. Yeah. But he reviewed this book called Surviving the Wild. Campers, if you don't have a copy of this yet, put it on your list of things to do shortly. Um, it's by Josh Inyard, Gray, Gray Bearded Green Beret, and it is awesome. I've read a lot of books, and like he was saying in, the, in his review, um, most of them are dry and most of them are the same thing just rehashed and you know you can only describe something so many ways but josh comes at a fresh approach um, it's very readable easily easily readable and uh, i'm seems like every time i start it 16 things come up that have to be done now so uh, I'm not very far into it, but I've loved what I've read so far. And like I said, if you haven't got it yet, get you a copy. You can look on uh, Blackie's review 
And he's, well, I'll, ju I'll just show you the yeah, ISB. You can show the ISB in here on the back. All right, let's see if I can get this thing positioned. All right, there we go. I'll take a couple of minutes and let y'all copy down the ISB number. You can pause the video and get it. Yeah, y'all, you can even pause the video and get it, but that's it. And I highly, highly recommend it. Not that my opinion counts a whole lot, but I do highly recommend it. Well, I mean, that's just the thing. You want people to view a work at different skill levels. Yeah. If I have, I've had people, all the professionals told me this was the book to get. Well, it is for a professional. Yeah. But the average person. I, he's not talking about this book. Not that book. He's, he's talking, talking about, about a book. Other books. And it, it was highly recommended by a lot of the big names, and I go get it, and it's a very technical book. But the average person, it's out of their wheelhouse. It's out of their wheelhouse. You know, you got to have a lot of experience to be able to, to understand what they're talking about. On the other hand, a book that is written for the person at the entry level that gives you a good working knowledge, but don't go too detailed right. intent, would be a better book for somebody starting out, but not for somebody that's got 20 years experience in it. So. This is the second item that I wanted to share with you. Now, for scores of old ways, we've been talking about Lehman's. And Lehman's is, an, is a company out of Kidron, Ohio. And they generally uh, supply the Amish in the area. That's their bread and butter. But they do sell to us common folk. And this is their... Uh, catalog for uh, let's see actually this is this is an older catalog but this is it it's got down here at the bottom I don't know if you can see that but it's got their 800 number it's 800 4385346 800-438-5346 and it's got their website, lehmans.com, L-E-H-M-A-N-S.com. And you can go on there. They have literally thousands of items. They've got lanterns. This is just their best sellers page. They've got lawn decorations. They've got tools. They've got food. They've got gardening items, lamps, uh, natural remedies, uh, yard games, just all kinds of things. They've got crocs for making sauerkraut. <clears throat> you can even get you a traditional uh, sewing machine that's run by a treadle, a foot treadle. how to tap your own trees. They've got a whole kit that they sell. But um, it's a good company. I, I like them. I've done business with them for years. And uh, like I said, go on to uh, lehmans.com and check them out. I think you'll be pleased. They are a real good source of uh, cast iron, pinware, uh, non-electrically powered things like yeah. thump pumps and everything else windmills kerosene lanterns you know it's one of the things where if it doesn't require electricity they're probably a good source to get it now because they specialize in non-electric you might be a little stick there might be a little sticker shock involved it's worth it okay because a bird in the hand is worth two in the bushes, my granddaddy used to say. And if you can find it here, but nowhere else, you know, this is this is your best option. Plus, they're making it for use. They're not making it for yes. a touristy thing for yeah. decoration. They they do, like you say, they do cater to the Amish. 
So it's got to actually work whenever they make it. And uh, that makes a difference whenever you're trying to come up with something uh, for putting on an off-grid uh, cabin or something like that. And you got one that actually works, it holds up, and it's fairly durable, it's well worth it. Even if it's more money up front, as long as it works and it does a good job, that's the whole thing. Most of what's in there tool-wise and appliance-wise, you'll pass down to your grandchildren. So you'll get your price back. You'll get your money back in the long run. Think of it as an investment in your in your children or your grandchildren's future. Would you agree? I would agree. I think it'd be a well worth it in a lot of them. Um, I got a bush pot. I was gifted a uh, somebody want to know about the new Pathfinder bush pot one quart and so they gifted me the uh, resources for it and said they wanted to hear my take on it and I said okay and I ordered one and got it in. That's the one you just did the review. I did uh, the painting on it and got it ready and uh, I filmed another episode with it now where I'm talking about how to make uh, meals for it where you take larger family portions and cut them down to a a, a small single bush pot a level where I can utilize it in the field and that I've already filmed that but that'll be coming out soon I haven't quite got it posted yet but I don't know I've been really impressed with that little bitty pot it's about the right size and uh, you know hell most of my life I've lived out of a canteen cup and so, but a lot of the guys, they don't carry canteens anymore. They carry round water bottles. And so, you know, understanding that, that they're, they're doing their bit and they don't carry what I carry. I decided, all right, I'll do something kind of like for them. I decided that would be a good thing to get. And uh, when a person was telling me about it, they got one. Wanted me to show them how to cook with it. So they offered to get me one if I just you know, utilize it and use it for cooking. You got it from Self Reliance. Self Reliance, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. But I, uh, one of them mornings where you're busy and you're trying to get, I got stuff going on in the garden and everything else. And so I decided I'd do what I had to do in the garden and at the same time shoot the video. So I had turned the, trash, turned the camera on, I took the trash can, spun it around there, and I painted it right quick. And uh, of course, didn't have glasses on. And of course, you sand the stainless because it's too slick and the paint may not stick, so you got to rough it up. And I took that 240 grit wet dry and went around it, roughed it up. People came out of the day, <laughs> like, are you declaring war on Canterbury or something? You went to sanding the Pathfinder logo off the pot. And said, it, it's just where I happened to start out, guys. I wasn't trying to start nothing controversial here. I was just sanding a pot of paint. So, I want to let everybody know that I wasn't trying to start nothing. I was just <laughs> sanding the pot. But I had people, you know, Blackie declared war. No, I ain't done nothing. Y'all can forget that. All I was doing was just sanding the pot. But, uh... <laughs> Oh, that's funny. You gotta be careful what you do. <laughs> Somebody's gonna misinterpret what you're doing. When all you're doing is just, you know, painting something. What was it that uh, um, Freud said? Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Sometimes it's just a cigar, <laughs> yeah. It's nothing fancy. You know. Uh, coffee. When you were young... You, you just caught my attention. Yeah, I thought so. When you were young, mom or dad get up in the morning and make coffee. Right. It was always a, a thing. There was always going to be coffee made every morning. We woke up, because usually the parents would get up and start the coffee before they ever woke us up. They needed coffee before they could put up with the young. You know, and... Uh, I can remember my grandmother uh, going in there and making coffee. Now in the morning it was Maxwell House, but if she wanted to cut during the day, it was instant Sanka. 
But she had two kinds of coffee. Well, and that way you didn't have to fix a whole pot. You didn't have to do a whole pot, whatever, but she'd go in there and she'd make, a little, we had a little bitty old coffee pot that held about, really about four cups, and that was it. And, uh, or two big man-sized cups, two mugs, or actually four cups. And so Granny would make about three cups, that was it. And she'd drink one first to warm up, and then that was waiting on the oven to heat up. And then she'd make her biscuits, she'd put the biscuits in, then she'd have her next cup, and it, about the time it took her to pour and drink the cup was how long it took the biscuits to be made. And then she brought the biscuits out and set them to let them cool and air out. And then she poured a third cup and she sipped on that. And then we would do, she, you know, whatever was going with the biscuits. But it was you know, coffee and, you know, it was always biscuit and something. Yeah. And so let's say on that morning it was bacon, she'd throw a couple of slabs of bacon in the skillet. And uh, so it'd be biscuit and bacon. And then she'd finish up that cup of coffee with that, and then we always had uh, orange concentrated, you know, orange juice. You took the puck and did, did they even make those anymore? I haven't seen them. frozen? Yeah. I don't know. I haven't seen them in a while, but I know that was, that was how we kept fresh orange juice or whatever. She'd finish up with orange juice, and that was, that was like dessert for breakfast with a glass of orange juice. And then that was that was breakfast, you know. But I was talking to somebody the other day, and they were talking about how, you know, why didn't I do a video on making coffee or all like that? And I told them, I said, look, I'm kind of weird. I don't drink coffee that much. I'm not one of them that's got to get up every morning and got to have coffee. But, good boy. I was at the Georgia Pathfinder, and I'm not trying to badmouth anybody, but. Yes, you are. Dude, me and this one old silver wolf, we talked to 2.45 in the morning. And finally, when we looked around and realized the entire camp had gone to bed and it was just me and him left up talking. And uh, he said, well, I guess you better go to bed. And I said, yeah, and I stood up and looked around. I did silver wolves. You know, we shut them down. He thought that was cool. We did that. I got down there and got into my hammock to go to sleep. And, uh, nope, just nothing. And, uh, got my hammock, go to sleep, and get that. <sighs> it's probably 3.15 in the morning. And about, from here to the tractor, the next 10 over went, John, are you up? Is that you, John? <laughs> no, 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 it's not. I'm over here. I wasn't up yet. Oh, okay. Are you going to get up and start coffee? I was thinking about coffee. You, you ready for some coffee? Yeah, I'm ready for some coffee. Are you going to start? I don't know if I'm going to. And they started this dang talk about coffee. And this talk went on for the next hour, each one trying to guilt and talk the other one into getting up and starting the coffee. There was about to be a tomahawking. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> and then the, the rooster cut loose across the road. <laughs> and he hollered till 6 a.m. So Blackie didn't get to go to sleep till 6 a.m. I love, you know, I understand people enjoy drinking coffee and everything else, but guys, don't be getting up in camp at 4 a.m. trying to wake the rest of the camp up to see if they want coffee. Just say it. In the greater public interest, don't do that. Yeah. In a matter of safety, you know. Oh, boy. It was a ritual in my granddad's way he made his coffee. He would get up at a certain time, he would go in there, he would start the coffee up <coughs> and uh, put a measured amount in the pot. Did you ever, you know, what they call co cowboy coffee today, um, did y'all actually have a fancy coffee pot or one of them sat on the stove and had the little basket in it and you boiled in there? Well, mom and, mom and daddy had one that just sat on the counter and just percolated. Oh wow, an electric pot. Yeah. Wow, y'all y'all was top notch. But uh, I think they got it when they got married, and that thing worked until about probably 
89 or 90. Yeah, 40, 40, 50 <laughs> years they <laughs> were. He died. Um, but yeah, I drank a mini of gallon of coffee out of that little pot. My daddy was one. He drank three pots a day at least. And uh, I was sort of a disappointment to him because I wouldn't drink coffee with him. I will drink it on cold mornings and I'll drink it for taste once in a while, but I'm just not a big coffee drinker. Never have been. But you know, we talked about earlier that uh, I got to be 16, 17. And of course, my dad had said that, you know, by now, if I hadn't taught you right and wrong, I'm not going to teach it to you the next couple of hours. So I was kind of responsible for myself. And on Friday nights and Saturday nights, he said, you go do what you want to do. However, you can stay out whenever you want to. You ain't got no curfew. But however, understand at 6 a.m., you're coming out of that bed, and we're going to work a full eight hour day. <laughs> They ain't gonna be, Daddy, I'm hungover, Daddy, I'm sick, Daddy, I feel bad. Work starts at six. Work, we're gonna be up at six. We're gonna have to be out of leaving the house by 6.20 or working in the yard. By 6.30, we'll be in the yard. If it's cutting grass day, if it's working the garden day, if it's building a barn day, if it's whatever, and you will work a full eight hour day. So you go ahead and lay out all you want. And there was several mornings there that Daddy would get up at 5.30 and he'd come walk in the kitchen. I'd have coffee ready going, what are we doing today? I didn't even bother going to bed. <laughs> I knew, you know, was it worth it? Sometimes it was. Sometimes it wasn't. But uh, my granddaddy gave me the best piece of advice for that. He said, son, you're going to wake up one morning sick and tired of waking up sick and tired. And you'll cut back on some of that wild running around. He was right. It kind of, you start getting more and more like, I don't think I want to sleep tomorrow. <laughs> Man, let's go to the beach. Let's go party. Let's go do this. We'll go sit on the riverbank. Well, that, uh huh. I think I'm going to go to the house, guys. I'm going to get me a, I'm going to sleep tonight. I had a hard week and I didn't want to go party. Oh, come on, Blackie. Oh, come on now. Don't be a party pooper. You know you want to do that. You knew work started at six. I knew work started at six. Well, how about the uh, coon hunt? You know, coon hunting was traditionally, we'd all agree that this Friday night we're going to be at your place. So we'd all go home, eat supper, and then we'd grab our hog dog, or coon dog, if it's coon hunting. And we'd come to your place and we'd run your woods looking for coons. And then that run to like 11 or 12 and then we'd all go home, you know. If somebody didn't have a bunch of beer and we'd sit in the back pasture and all of us would have a drink and talk and etc. Responsibly. Responsibly, yes. But at the same time, I mean, we got education. <laughs> Some of the best education when you wake up, yep. you just can't hold your head up no more. Yep, some of the best school in the world. My brother was a big coon hunter. Um, I, I was I was not a big coon hunter. I admit it. Um, but I do love deer hunting, turkey hunting, squirrel hunting, rabbit hunting, dove, all that. I, I really enjoyed. And by the way. Turkey season goes out in four days. Guys, I apologize. I just don't see me getting one with that uh, tule that I told you I was going to try to do. I don't see it happening this season. There's just too many things going between now and Sunday. But uh, Ain't that the way it is down here in the south where it's hot and then we get winter? And then it's too cold, too cold, and suddenly it warms up, but it's not too hot yet. And every social group, church group, ladies organization, mama, whatever, every weekend you're wrapped up 
You can't go do nothing because well, this weekend we're doing that, and next weekend we're doing this, and next Tuesday we're doing this. Remember Wednesday night we got this at the church. And finally about June when they slack up and it's so hot, we don't want to do nothing. Yeah, and then the season's out. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> that That's my big deal is uh, the seasons, they... Uh, you know, it's like he was saying, sometimes like in turkey season, it just gets too hot. Quick. It literally does. You get out there, you're covered up in, uh, in your camouflage, and you got your head net on, and you just can't breathe. It's 85 degrees yeah. with 75 or 80 percent humidity. And we're talking about right after daylight. Yeah. I mean, hey. right, right, right after daylight. Eight or nine o'clock. Well, we've been real lucky. Um, this year, we've actually had a real spring. It's been That's cool. true. That's true. Also, <clears throat> and turkey season came in uh, the 15th of March. How many storm systems have we had come through since the 15th of March? Four, at five? Five, six at least. Yeah. And I know we're not talking about, oh, there's a thunderhead, boom, rain, over. No. No, we're talking two, three, four days of nearly continual rain, thunder, and lightning. Yeah, and wind. We had a, don't like to be out in storms. They're not coming off the roost. They'll mm -hmm. sit up in the tree. They'll ride it out in the tree. Um, but we had a hailstorm come through here about a month ago, and literally there are hundreds of cars here in my town that have been having to have hail damage repaired. Mm -hmm. uh, both of mine got it pretty good too. But anyway, yeah, life I, marches on. I was lucky it didn't get me that it kind of focused. Yeah. But you're on the edge of, you're literally on the side of a river. And so this is a big river valley right here. And those clouds, they're coming along with their storm fronts, so they hit that drop of altitude and increase in humidity up coming off them rivers yeah. and suddenly that's just a magic trigger and they just go to dumping. There are two rivers that come together here that are pretty much equal size. One of them is about twice as long as the other one but they're probably I don't know uh, 60 80 yards wide. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> that generates an awful lot of humidity. Uh, there's a third one that comes in from the other side of town that's not quite that big, but it drains a huge area also. And when you come into our town, there's five roads that come in, and four of them you cross a bridge. There's a reason they named it Elba, because Elba was an island <laughs> in history. That's the island that uh, Napoleon was exiled to, and when the Waterloo was over and the Napoleonic Wars was over, a lot of the, the French soldiers and officers were not allowed to go back to France because they had fought against France under Napoleon. And so they asked could they come to the United States to go to the old Louisiana Territory, which Napoleon had just sold to the U.S. And that's how Demopolis got formed. That's how Demopolis, that's how Elba got here because Elba was a, some of the French troops came in this neck of the woods down here. And they named it after Elba. So. Yeah, that's where Napoleon <clears throat> was. It's an island in the Mediterranean where Napoleon was exiled to uh, between uh, before Waterloo. Yeah, he, he had actually, they kind of locked him up like that, and then he got... Yeah, he escaped. Well, not so much escaped. He just got a, the, the troops, loved him, and he walked up and asked them if they recognized him. They said, yeah, and he said, if you want to kill your emperor, now's the time, and they didn't shoot him. And he got them to turn around and, and uh, join his thing, and they reunited under him. His troops loved him, even though he got a lot of them killed. So. 
Yeah, he, uh, <clears throat> after Waterloo, they sent him to St. Helena, which is an island in the South Atlantic. Nothing's close to St. Helena, uh, except the Atlantic Ocean. It's almost equidistance between South America and Africa. It's one of those places you gotta be going to to get there. Well now, us coming around 20 years after World War II, the stories that we heard as boys about military commanders and stuff like that, I heard stories about Patton, I heard stories about Vinegar Joe Stilwell in Burma. I heard stories about the Marines and island hopping campaigns. I heard about family members that were on D-Day. Uh, and then also from a lot of the older uncles and older grandfathers, you heard stories about the Civil War and World War One and Indian Wars, and, you know. Right. So we got to hear those stories about that. And what gets me is, Vietnam right now is as far away as the Indian Wars from us yeah. when we were coming in. So those old men were talking about things that they had dealt with. You know, I can remember a, an old gentleman that lived down there that uh, he, he was in his late 90s when I was a little bitty boy. And uh, we had the, the parade downtown and he showed up standing there wearing his uh, cavalry uniform and his medal or whatever he'd got in, in 1880s. You know, here it was, late 1960s. That was about 100 years ago. He was old, old, old at that time. 1880s, 1890s, something like that. And I remember my grandmother, we were standing there looking at it, and he says, he thinks he's something. Hell, he ain't been in the damn cavalry in 50 years. Well, good God, honey, when you think back, you know, he ain't been in the cavalry in 50 years. And I remember somebody else standing there said, we ain't had horses in 50 years. Yeah. Well, we did. A lot of people don't realize how many horses we had in World War II. Oddly enough, <clears throat> there are, there was a unit that fought in, I believe it was in Afghanistan, <clears throat> that was the first time that U.S. soldiers had ridden horses into cavalry in the, nearly a hundred years. Yeah, but it was the right tool for the job. And that next was right tool for the job. They remember they made a movie about it. It's called Twelve Strong. Yeah. So you might want to check that out. It's a good film. When uh, I had family members that were in Vietnam and they had got up on a ridge and a lot of bad guys were trying to surround them. And there was too much anti-air in there, they couldn't come in and pick them up and they tried to figure a way to get out of there. And Billy um, remembered stories that his granddaddy had told about tactics that they had used against the Indians that he had learned from his daddy. And so he had two of his guys uh, go up the ridge a little bit above them and uh, dig a hole and build a fire in it and then come back down. Well, the bad guys down there and things looking further up the hill saw that and they started putting mortar rounds and everything else. When the mortar rounds went to hitting, that's when they went sneaking downhill and they got another three, four hundred yards downhill and now all the artillery and stuff sitting up there and they're convinced that's where they were and all of his guys dug in and camouflaged and he said right at dawn all the bad guys went running up the hill and said then we hauled that. <laughs> and they had, he, he talked about a family member had done that. They were surrounded by Indians and it was just a few of the soldiers and they'd built a fire up on the hill above them yeah. and the Indians would lob shells into that shooting rifles trying to think they were up there around the fire and what they were doing every time they'd open up we'd scoot a little further downhill getting away from it and finally when they charged and assaulted we were behind them at that point you know they were running by us so they were sure we were up there on top of that hill old yeah. tactics come back if you know what you're doing people are people they're still just as gullible and dumb oh, yeah. today as they were back in yeah people 
People don't change, tactics do. Yeah. But, uh, Now, you're trying to make a spoon on one end and a spatula on the other. No, no. I'm gonna take this side. I gotta sharpen my knife. I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna make a spoon out of this. Uh huh. And I'm going, I'm gonna take, no, I'm gonna take, this is my spatula, I'm sorry. This is gonna be my spoon. Mm hmm. And, uh, cause you can see it's got a nice bow on the back and kind of a natural bowl here at the bottom. And uh, it's gonna be a work in progress. Yeah, you'll be able to get it. Yeah, my, my wonderful Mora, by the way, thank you, Chris, again. It's the first Mora that I've ever had, but it's not very sharp. I've got to, I've got to get an edge put on it. But I love it. Those are some of the best little crafting blades, starting out blades. They're always a good value for the money. Oh, and uh, when I was at, <coughs> excuse me, when I was asked to come teach a big church group some basic stuff and wanted to hire me for a seminar, and we got there on uh, Saturday morning and I handed out the $1 kitchen knives, those stainless steel $1 Dollar Tree kitchen knives, and a big hunk of mimosas. And we were going to do tri sticks. Well, I gave him about three hours of playing with that, and then we did lunch. When we came back from lunch, I took up them junk knives. And I handed them more. And you'd be amazed at the knife skills they suddenly grew because now they had a comparison. They had a little bit of knife understanding. And it was a much better knife and it was able to be used a lot more effectively. And suddenly the design of the knife did matter and they were carving spoons, they were carving whatever. We were making usable things out of it pretty quick. As we went on to doing other parts, Half of them kept hauling around while we're sitting there. They're whittling on their spoons while we're talking about the next topic and getting people to get up. This one fella, it was his turn to get up. I said, okay, come on up. I was teaching them how to uh, tie a knot. And he said, can, can you shift to somebody else? I'm about to make the bowl in this, and I'm kind of on a run. So go for it. And I went to somebody else. <laughs> oh, yeah. You just keep going at it. But all the old man whittled whenever we were young. They did. I mean, Granddaddy and I made a chess set. <clears throat> yeah, now, I heard somebody say one time, if you ever see an old man pull out his pocket knife and an apple, you better listen to what he's about to say. Yeah. Because it's going to be profound. You know, we grew up using a pocket knife for everything. And I don't believe I had a pair of fingernail clippers until I was 25 or 26. We always cut our fingernails and toenails with a pocket knife. And me and my wife had, were dating and we were sitting on the couch watching, she loves flip flops. And we were watching some movie on a VCR. Wow, that was a long time. It was a long time ago. Yeah, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Me and her have been together 30 some odd years now, and you know, I've been in love with her 40 some years, pushing 50 years. And uh, she, uh, I was you know, rubbing her feet, and I hit something, and I said, Look, and she said, oh, my toenails are too long, I'm gonna have to cut them. I didn't even blink, I just pulled out my pocket knife and one, two, three, four, five, and give me a foot, honey. <laughs> And I turned around, I looked at her face, and this look of abject terror was on her face. I mean, I literally, she was too terrified to move. She didn't realize what I was gonna do when I grabbed that foot and I grabbed that little toe. And one, two, three, four, five, that's a big toe. Okay, give me the other foot. <laughs> oh, to this day, she will tell you about that, how that scared the living snot out of her. She had never seen somebody use a pocket knife like that. And on her toes, that was the worst part. I mean, wow. Yeah, I can I can see where that would be an eye-opening experience. You know, but it was common to us. I mean, broke the fingernail, put the pocket knife out, cleaned it up. I mean, it was a way to do it. Yeah. 
if I was off with granddaddy and I hit a snag, give me some here, kid. Done. Yeah. I hooked a treble hook in my leg. Um, we were in the barn getting something and it was a big old pile of stuff and I didn't see that it was up there was an old broke fishing rod in there in the lure. And I went and kind of forced my way up in there to reach something and that big old treble hook hooked me in the leg. I mean a, a big catfish treble hook. Well the line was sold and rotten that it broke and so it left the treble hook in me. My Uncle Bill squatted down, I was probably about eight years old, seven or eight. He squatted down and said, hold on boy, and he picked me up and set me up onto the tackle box of the toolbox of the truck and it's about where your pocket is on your right side. I said, well, is it in you or is it on you? I said, it's in me. Of course, I'm sitting there trying to fight back tears and he said, all right, turn your head and look that way. I'm gonna do the magic trick to get it out of there. I went, okay. The magic trick was taking the tip of a case pocket knife and just slide it in beside of it and bring the hook out and then pull the knife out. But, but it worked. It left a hole in you, but it was a clean hole. Yeah. And so he said, take a deep breath and count three. I went, one, he jabbed that pocket knife in. <laughs> Brought he just jabbed in and put the hook out in one motion. Out come the hook. He kept the pocket knife in me. He reached in his back pocket and he pulled out that little butter bean flask of something corn licorice yeah. and poured it, this medicinal, medicinal, poured it down the blade and turned the blade sideways so it got down in there to disinfect it because it was a rusty old hook. And he pulled the blade out and then he put his finger on it real hard and said, it'll be all right in just a minute, boy. I never got the two. <laughs> I didn't say two. I wasn't crying. I was just... <laughs> I couldn't even get a good breath of air. And it's all right, boy, it's all over now. It's all over now. Yeah. You don't even know it was there. It'd be all right. And he held that finger there, blood tight for about five minutes and he let off. Said, See, it's quit bleeding. Now we're all right, now let's go back doing what we're doing. Oh yeah. Yeah, I had those two. We, uh... how about teeth pulling? No, I never had that one. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's when the parent takes that wet bath cloth and reaches in your mouth and grabs a hold of that baby tooth. Oh, well, yeah, now that one, yes. Yeah, yes. my daddy had a hand like a like a Sasquatch, and he just wedged the fingers in there and get a hold of it and come out. Daddy was a principal at one of the elementary schools over in Enterprise for years. The kids used to save his teeth, save their teeth, mm -hmm. and to, for him to go pull. Yeah, they would go in. Uh, he had a, a time of the day. Folks needed him pull. They would go in. He would get a bath cloth and go in there and swap the tooth out. Just that quick. Strong, powerful hand. He'd pull it out clean in one hit. He probably pulled a wash tub full. I remember that. You remember the old thing they'd show on TV about where you tie a string to it and yes. slam a door? Yes. No, we never did that crap. That, no, it was always a washcloth and yeah. one of the parents would reach in and you didn't go to a dentist for that. It's just baby teeth. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. How about when the kid got burned real bad, sunburnt, and they'd use witch hazel on them? Yeah. Or butter. Or butter. It'd take the fire out of it. Another thing I have found that takes the fire out really, really well is just plain old yellow mustard. Yeah, yellow mustard does, French's yellow mustard does real good. It'll pull it out. And uh, I burned my finger a while back and I put some yellow mustard on it. It didn't even blister. Oh, uh, Jeff Cross, he, uh, dumped something hot on himself at a living history event and we uh, just by luck somebody had cooked hot dogs and there was a big old thing of that French's mustard yeah and we just immediately slathered it in it and uh, first thing we did was plunge his hand in cold water to take as much surface heat out as we could and then we followed it up with that mustard and that helped 
by the end of the day, you could already, it looked like a, a sunburn was it, yeah. but it was going to be bad if we didn't take that heat out right now. We had a little one that reached up and grabbed a hot coal, and we plunged a hand in the dish water because that was the cool water we had, and rinsed off right quick. And made him stick, just took the lid off and made him stick his hand into one of them mayonnaise jars of yellow yes. mustard. Yes. And so keep it in there, don't bring it out. And he cried for about 10 minutes and he quit crying. And then his mama got back there to us. He, there's a bunch of kids working together right around there. She got back, and she was ready to take him to the ER, and she got the mustard washed off, and his hand wasn't even hardly, you know, yeah. at all. And she said, what'd you do? She'd been a nurse, French mustard, <laughs> you know. When you pour, you do what you got, and that's all you can do, you know. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's talk about the future of the channel. So All it's right. yours and mine. Alright, sounds good. Um, it just occurred to me. We're getting into the season of canning. And uh, I promised that I would do some canning on my channel. And we're probably going to do some here on Old Ways. Um, I am not uh, the end all be all of canning. But I can do it. You will share what you know. I, I will share my my knowledge on uh, here on Blackie's channel on the old ways and on mine as well. Well, now hold on. What we did last time, what we'll do with this one is old ways will be published on Bear's channel first, and then it'll be published on my channel the next week. So if you want to see it first, you gotta go to Bear's channel. Um. I have also got some uh, some bacon that I have that I salt cured and put up. I was not able to finish it. Life raised its ugly head, and uh, I was not able to complete it. Oh, thank you. But anyway, what I had thought about doing was setting up a time to get with him and you know finish up the bacon that I've got and smoke it. It's, uh, it's not hard to do. Uh, there is a little bit involved in it, which is just natural. Um, All right, now, when you're saying about smoking the bacon, let's start from scratch. You've got a slab of raw bacon right off the dam. Yes. What's your first operation? You gonna brine it or anything? What you do? Well, you get you get what's called the salt, the the pork belly, which is the the stomach area of the hog. Mm -hmm. um, you get that, and you divide it up into the size portions that you want. I usually slice mine up into what works out to be about two pounds each, and then mm -hmm. I will. Uh, put them in a mixture of salt and brown sugar. Now, when you say put them in a mixture, is it a dry rub? It's a dry rub. It's a dry rub. It's a dry okay. rub. All this is done dry. It's a dry rub that's roughly a half and half of sugar and, and salt, brown sugar and salt. And I will let them sit in that for about five to seven days mm -hmm. then I'll wash it off dry it real good and reapply and let it sit for another five to seven days mm -hmm. what you want to do is you want to get your gear moisture out of it so you'll in a in a plastic tub you'll need some sort of way to elevate it in the tub um, a good way to do that is to get a second tub and drill holes in the bottom of it and stick it inside the larger of the two. And that way the, the liquid drains out of the of the bacon and off it's not sit the bacon's not sitting in it. Now are we putting this at room temperature or are we refrigerating it right now while we're doing it? It is done in the refrigerator. Okay. Um, 
I mean, back in the day, it sat on the counter. But today, uh, I, I do mine in the fridge. Uh, you want to turn it every day. So if you start it skin side up, you want to go in and flip it over, skin side down, and let it sit, and then come back and flip it skin side up, skin side down. And then when you get to day five, you get it out and you wash it, wash the salt and sugar off of it, and then dry it off real good and reapply. Um, after that, I have a, a, a grill that has a smoker box on the end of it and the main unit here. And what I'll do is I will put aluminum foil in the main area and I will put uh, a layer of sand in it because it's going to drip. It, when you smoke it, it's, it's going to render out of it. And I didn't, I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing the last time I did it. And the next time I went to use the grill, all of that grease in there flared up. And I had, uh, we were cooking hamburgers and they were the most delicious flavored hamburgers I oh, think yeah. I've ever cooked. Burning bacon <laughs> grease hamburger, there you go. Oh yeah, it was awesome. But anyway, I'll do that um, coming up. Um, my, my garden is now, I've already had my first harvest out of my garden. We had a salad. I've got tomatoes everywhere and I've got red tomatoes this week. I will be harvesting my first run of tomatoes. Here it is the first week of May and I've got that. I've got a squash that is about ready to harvest. I'm waiting for it to soften a little bit. You know, it's hard as that, but when it gets a little soft is when you start, you know. I'm gonna do that. I'm really don't let it turn orange. No, if, no, no. If it keep it yellow, it will be yellow. If it turns orange, it's, it's gone. Well, it's too bitter by then. But yeah, it'd be it be it's about ready for me to slice it in chunks and drill it. And uh, I've got snap. It's not snap peas. They're little snow peas yeah. that we put into a salad. The predominant focus of my little garden was to give salad ingredients. The squash will be for grilling. And so I got tomatoes and that, and then I've got some big boy tomatoes that when they get full size, they'll be sandwich tomatoes because we like tomato sandwiches down here in the south, especially in the summer. And uh, but even the small tomatoes, which are the little cherries, I got several varieties of that. Um, they're going to be sliced up, made into sandwiches as well, as well as being add-ons put into spaghetti or whatever. I'm about ready to start after that, and as we've talked about in earlier videos, I want to do something, if I have enough of my big ones, the thing we saw on YouTube about putting them in a jar with water and something in it, I'll have to go back and look at the video, I got it saved, but she calls it tomatoes in snow. Remember what I'm talking about? It's that lady, you keep, we both did. She puts them in there and then she puts the stuff in, I think it's salt and that, and seals it up, no canning, it's just she seals it up. I forgot about that one. And put them up on the shelf. She says she can keep them for months and months. Yeah. And I want to see if that'll work. If that, I'm willing to sacrifice a couple of tomatoes to give it a try. I might go get some from the store and just try it, you know? Honestly, I, I completely forgot about that. But if that'll work without having to run a canner and cook them, yeah. and it will keep them viable, where we could get them to run on, especially late in the season, that's when you go to doing that and putting them up so in, in January and February you could have fresh tomato. Yes. Well, that's the whole intent of canning is uh, so that you can have off-season vegetables and fruit, that kind of thing. Um, that's, you know, the whole intent of jams and jellies mm -hmm. was to preserve the, uh, to preserve the fruits <clears throat> so that you could have them in the off season. Speaking of which, I'm gonna be doing beauty berry again. Yeah, that was good. Make beauty berry jelly. I'm gonna make some more. And this time, I'm gonna use enough pectin that it'll gel. And we'll do a we'll do a, a entire episode on that. We'll talk about this. My favorite uh, natural mosquito repellent down here in the south is American beauty berry. The leaves. 
Yeah. And then we'll pick the, whenever the berries hit right, we'll pick them and we'll make uh, jelly out of it. Yeah. That was actually good. That was a really good flavor. Yeah, it did. I, I liked it. It was, it was very unique. Very, very unique flavor. It had a sweet tartness. Yeah. That is unlike any other flavor you try to compare it to. Yeah, it was. It had a little bit of a of a grape, but it also tasted a lot like a raspberry. The closest thing I can tell you is when you go to the store, there's a minute made half gallon thing that. Uh, it's not great, but it's like fruit punch. It's not red, but it's grape color. Yeah. And they're like a buck for one of those things. That tastes similar to me. Yeah. It's not overly sweet. It's not, it's like a tart, but really beauty berry is a little sweeter than that. But whenever I saw that, you, know, you gave me that sample, that's the first thing that popped in my head was yeah. that. Because we used to buy that and have extra juices at the house. That was always number eight. You got a good memory of it. I don't know. They, they blur together to me after a while. Yeah. That was a minute ago. But, uh, yeah, those are things that we're going to be doing. Um, I, you know, like I said, life. I haven't even started my garden yet. I'm going to be, I'm going to be doing container gardens too. I mean, I just don't have the time to get out there and, and work in the garden. I, I work at night. And I work every other weekend, and I've got four kids at the house, and it just... And none of them have a green thumb. A very few, Well, they could, but they don't. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the thing. I've got... I started early. I was in actually February when I got mine going. And everybody said, oh, that's way too early. No. Not if, you're, not if you're container gardening. I was container gardening, and when we had that cold snap come in, it was going to yep. be 20-something, I just picked up my entire garden and walked it in the house. Yep. Sat it down on a tarp in the living room, and it was perfectly fine, and went warm back up. I brought it back out. You know, yep. put a grow light on it if it's going to be in there several days because you got an arctic front just sitting on you. And I went and got me a grow bulb, and I got me a focus light put over the top of them. It's not going to thrive, but it will maintain until you get it back out. For those of you that <clears throat> watch his live feed on Thursday nights, shameless plug. Yeah. <clears throat> I can I saw it last year. He had tomatoes in that room that he that he does his live in up until yes, almost it was, Christmas. It was actually the week after Christmas it finally died. Did it, was, it? it was between Christmas and New Year's. He had a grow light. He had it in a protected area, and he had tomatoes fresh off the plant until Christmas. That that one just kept producing. The rest of them petered out. And to be honest, I thought this one was going to die. That one you're talking about. And I kept watering everything, kept an eye on it, and it kept staying green. And it kept putting out blooms. And I thought, well, yeah. And then next thing you know, it was forming another clutch. And I said, well, I'll... <laughs> I'll give it the benefit of the doubt. And that was in November. And it made another clutch, and it made another clutch. And I put, all the others were gone, and I composted them. Yeah. But that one, I moved it in there, and I just kept a grow light on it, and made sure I kept it watered and, and fed. And it kept doing it. And finally, between Christmas and New Year's, finally when it gave up the ghost, and that was it, and I composted. But I, two of the plants, that I've started, they won't start producing. They're, they're about yeah. eight inches right now. There's seedlings out of that one. I'm trying to see if I can regrow it because it does, did grow from seed. <coughs> so I was say, it huh? It wasn't an heirloom? I guess, but I grew some <coughs> seeds and I got me, it's a big cherry, and I got me about uh, eight tomatoes worth of seeds out of it and dried them. I've got pumpkin seeds waiting. Yeah. I'll put them in in uh, June. And all I want to do is plant about six or seven because all I want to do is grow a pumpkin for Halloween. How many have you got? How many seeds have I got? Probably 50. Okay. You want a couple? Sure. All right, I'll give you a couple. I was going to say, you can also, they were trail food. Yeah, yeah. For, for the Indians. Oh, yeah. 
my, my wife loves it. And that was the hard part was we had got a bottle of pumpkin at the store and uh, come home and, and cleaned it up for her to make her a jack-o'-lantern. And I said, save the seeds. And next thing I know, I hear the oven kick on. <laughs> and I went there and she was roasting and drying seeds. And I said, I thought we agreed we were gonna save some seeds. And she held up a baby food jar with like 50 of them in it. So there you go, I saved you seeds. <laughs> All right, and I put them in a mesh bag so they wouldn't mold or nothing. And it's actually hanging up in my study. Mrs. Blackie's awesome. She's awesome. <laughs> she really is. She's not the gardener of the bunch. I'll just tell you that in a heartbeat. She's fantastic with kids and small animals. She's got a true gift. Yeah. But she could kill a concrete plant. I mean, she just love her to death, but she just hunted. I made her happy. I saved a rose that she had. She likes baby roses, made little bitty roses. And uh, last year I saved one of hers that she thought she'd kill. And it, in fact, this week it bloomed again. I've got it and another one out in a container in the front yard. I figured out what they needed for soil and what they needed for sun. And so they bloomed. The other one has got about a dozen buds that hadn't bloomed yet. So she's real happy. Well, that's good. And all she wants to do is walk by, look at it, and I feed it and water it <laughs> and keep it going. Well, that's good. That's but now, uh, my granddaddy, he grew pepper plants. He also had five gallon buckets that had mealworms in it for fishing. And my granddaddy passed away. That was one of the big arguments in the family was who was ending up with that, that them dozen buckets of pepper plants and who was ended up with them six or seven buckets of mealworms. And there was some correlation there. He would take um, when he was making up a new mealworm bucket, and he, he had six, every year he would add a new bucket, and he would transplant some out of all five, six into it, and one bucket would be completely gutted out, get all the worms out of it, and that was the oldest, and he was going to retire it, and then that soil went in he had pepper plants. And so that was his big secret was he was using that old meal worm, meal poop, uh, worm poop, yeah. I guess, to grow them pepper. And he made some of the hottest little bitty peppers, you know, before anybody ever heard the term ghost pepper or anything. But he, he made some of the hottest pepper sauce. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I also want to do some cooking. Y'all have been very patient with both of us about uh, wanting us to do cooking and it's coming. Um, we need to do it pretty quickly because uh, if y'all remember when we did the bread, the bread and biscuit bacon? Oh my stars. Now that was always six. I remember that one because that was burned up here. We had sweat rolling. It, we looked like we had jumped in the river. And we, we had the fire 20 feet from us. We're over here at the table, but just to walk over there yeah. and check and et cetera, and it was so hot and humid, we'd walk away and sweat would be just dripping off of it. Yeah. Trying to do that quick thing, so. I, uh, I, it just, it blew my mind. And we, we did that at about eight o'clock in the morning. And it was that, that or humid that at eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah. But, you know, we don't, you've got access to a big kitchen where we can do canning and stuff. Right. You know, we can talk recipes and stuff like that. I'm, I, I, they should see the video I'm talking about before this post of where I took the little Pathfinder bush pot and I measured out, showed you how to take a big family unit and divide it down into foil packets to go in there yeah, and I take the field. I heard you, I watched you talk about that. And so I'm going to be doing that and start cooking with that. And I'm going to try, try, um, to at least once a week, I'll cook a lunch for me or something. I'll go out there and do it. Instead of building a big fire, I think I'm going to do my charcoal briquettes where I got them Kingsford charcoal briquettes in the paper bags. I'll just throw one down there, fire it up, put the pot on the grill with a hook above it and heat it up. And 
I'll show little bush pot cooking, and uh, but for the bigger stuff, like how to fry chicken, you know, we need a bigger kitchen for that, and put a camera in there. But a lot of people don't know how to fry chicken. You know, um, I had seen some true disasters at church function, some young bride, you know, now that her and her husband got married and they're living off and she's going to cook and she says, we'll bring chicken. Overcooked yeah, I see where chicken. this one's going. Oh my God, overcooked rubber chicken. And when Hope and I got together and she cooked chicken, but I grew up with what we call Granny Burnt Chicken. There were three black sides where she had rotated in that pan. Yeah. And there was a little bit of a black mark on it. And man, it made it so good. It had just a smoky flavor. It's not really burnt. It, it wasn't burnt, but it was well done. It was a black spot. Yeah. And she turned it three times, so there's three black spots going yeah. around it. And there was no raw spot in the middle? There was no raw spot in the middle, and it, was, it gave it a wonderful flavor. And I told her, you know, that's how I want chicken. And the way her face wrinkled up, I thought that was burn. She's the one started calling it granny burnt chicken. And so I got out a, a cast iron one night and used lard, didn't use cooking oil. She liked to spray pan and stuff like that. No, you gotta use lard or, or bacon grease. I was watching something, I'm glad you said that. I was watching something the other day where these people had rendered their own lard. Yeah. And uh, they processed a hog, a couple of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, as long as you're getting plenty of exercise in your day, lard is actually a very healthy fat. Yeah. A very healthy cooking medium. Well, uh, the great controversy, which was, has been exposed many times, um, back in the early 1900s, one of our presidents had a heart attack. And it was actually kind of rare to have heart attacks back in them days and the, the many doctors had never dealt with one and uh, when they figured out and he had basically high cholesterol and they claimed it was because of fat it wasn't it was because of sugar in the diet but the sugar industry which was like huge powerful industry yeah. every time that doctor went to try to talk and explain why it was because of sugar they'd pay hecklers to follow him around the country and discredit him and get rid of his funding and it was too much sugar is what it was but the sugar industry wasn't going to let you talk against them and definitely after world war ii by the 1950s heart attacks started becoming common because sugar had become available in everything yeah. And uh, lard, the body just digests and eats it. It's fat. It doesn't do anything bad. But they'll tell you, oh, it, it makes you this and that. Eskimos eat blubber, which is nothing but fat. <laughs> and they never had heart disease until they started getting sugar. Makes sense. And fat, I mean, what do the old mountain men crave? Fat. Yeah. Why do they want beaver tail? Beaver tail tastes like garbage. It really does, but it's high in fat. It's a fat, and you know, you had all these lean animals. They were eating a lot of lean wild game, and it was lean elk and lean mule deer. Because these things are climbing mountains out there. Right. They are not fat and chubby down here on that bottom. These things had to climb, stay away from wolves and predators, and so they were in excellent physical shape and very little fat. That's one reason that you, that back in the day, you targeted the cow yeah, and not the bull because the bull's all lean. There's very little fat on him at all, but the female would have some fat yeah. on her that would give them the energy that they required. Fat cow, lean bull. Yep. Yep, don't shoot the you, bull. You read Carry the Wind too, huh? I read Carry the Wind. <laughs> Good book to read. Oh, Scratch. Yep. Titus Bass. Whenever I read that, it made me think of Pascanel. Yep. It really did. I can, I can, I don't know if that guy was contemporary of Michener doing that, or if he'd saw the miniseries, and that's what inspired him to talk more about him, because the, the two characters are very similar to Pascanel and McKee. McKee. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What was Josiah? 
I can't remember what the kid's last name was, but Titus Bass, old mountain man, finds this kid, Josiah, that's about half dead, brings him back to life, teaches him how to live. It's a good book. Matter of fact, there's a whole series of books in that, uh, probably four or five. Four or five. Yeah. Yeah, and the fact that... Terry C. Johnson. It's in the, I think it's in the second book, they finally admit he put clues all the way in it that the old mountain man uh, had black hair and he always wore a big old bandana around his head yeah. and he'd have little wisps of gray hair. His beard was gray and then the boy found out that he was actually wearing a wig that he'd been scalped and he tracked down the Indian and scalped the Indian and tanned his hair and that's the wig. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's when he's wearing that blue bandana around his head is to hold the wig on because he's actually the top of his head is bald where he's scalped and he's got just a little bit of like fire tuck white hair around his side. Yeah, I could see that. There were stories of that. Uh, whoever that Mormon was that ended up with a hook uh, for his left hand. Um, his hand had been uh, hit by a uh, high caliber musket ball and just exploded. And while he was still unconscious, they cut his hand on off and uh, took this iron hook that was actually a pot hook heated it up cherry red, stuck the stump in the fire, and they jammed it up in between the two arm bones. That hurts to think about. He was unconscious, and then they took rawhide and sewed it tight around his forehead arm. So when he finally woke up, he had a hook. You know, they were trying to do it because they liked him. They were trying to make him work the function. But that, that wasn't a story. That really happened. Yeah. We, uh, like I said, we wanted to just fill y'all in We've got, uh, we're going to be doing cooking. We're going to be doing canning. Uh, what all did we say? We're going to be doing cooking, canning. We're going to try that experiment. We're making the uh, tomatoes in snow. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll try various things we've, out. We've got a lot of stuff coming down the pipeline. You got a dehydrator? Um, I don't, but we can improvise one. Well, that's what I'm saying. We can try improvising a smoker. We can try several. I've got the smoker. Well, smoker, smoker we can try smoker. done. You know, like I said, we've got access to a lot of chicken, yeah. big lots of chicken, 40 pounds at a time from the factory down here at a decent price. Yeah. And so we can do some stuff with that as well. So we'll try canning the chicken. We'll try um, getting meats, etc. And now I'm waiting for peas and butter beans to come in. Yes. That big uh, market down there at Wicksburg, they get the, I mean, the 10 pound bags from local, and I want to put some of that up in small units for me. Well, you know, I get those flyers about every quarter mm -hmm. where we can buy it bulk in a 10 pound bag, and we'll just can till we get tired of canning. Yeah, I want to can some, I want to freeze some and put them up because this year I want to try to, when the season ends, I want enough in my freezer. If not, and hoping I've done talk, I think I'm going to pick up another little deep, another chest freezer yeah. for vegetables and meat where we get deals. And so this coming fall, whenever we get hog or get deer, I'll have me go, well, right now I got ain't big enough to, to handle it. We had a big old uh, upright deep freeze for years and it finally gave up the ghost a few years ago and I never replaced it. Yeah, I've got a, I've got one that's for just meat. I've got one that I'm transitioning to just vegetable. And I've got a third one for just stuff. The stuff. Yeah. When I find bread on sale, mm -hmm. I'll buy bread in bulk and drop it in that freezer. I found my grinder, my crank grinder. Oh, really? Yeah, I've got it and several attachments, so we can make grind meat and stuff. There we go. I want to do that with it. I'll, I'll, I'll get with my brother. He's got the whole setup to do sausage and hams and whatever else. Uh, we do it with uh, with deer. Yeah, all I'm interested in doing is just taking us, picking us up some meat and turning it into ground hamburger meat or something like that, like yeah. we used to do, or when we get deer, we need to get a coon, so you can take coon fat or cow fat and mix the deer and make 
Yeah. Hamburger meat out of it. Make some packages of that. I've also got some bulk tallow yep. put up, so we'll we can render the tallow out and make tallow blocks. And use tallow. You can fry in it. You can bake bread with it. You can do all kinds of stuff. You can lube up your gun if it needs lubing up on it. On yeah. It. Well, we probably need to end it there because you done probably talk to now. I ain't even looked at the numbers. <laughs> We've been going a while. So. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you very much for joining us. And again, this will be posted first on, uh, from now on, all the old ways will be first be posted on the Bears channel. And the next week on Sunday, they'll be posted on my channel. And uh, if we ever have anything special coming up on Bears channel, like a cooking special or something like that, or a canning special, we'll give you plenty of head start so you know to tune in and check it out. Anything else, brother? I think we're good. All right. Lots of stuff, lots of good stuff coming down the pike. Lots of stuff we're doing. Check these books out too. Mm -hmm. Surviving the Wild by Joshua e Enard. Enyard. Enyard. Sorry, Josh. And check out his channel, Gray Bearded Green Beret. Good fella. Excellent. And uh, go down there and check out uh, Lehmans.com also. You'll be pleased. All right. Till next time, guys. I'm Blackie. And Bear. Wishing you safe journeys. Have a great day, guys.